Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, today I'll talk about over the wire data compression, which is the topic I've been working on. A quick intro about me I'm Enzo. I've been working on Swift KO on the, on the Samba team. I've been previously, previously in SUSE L3 support. Um, and about a year ago, I started with this project where Steve French, the Swift KO maintainer, asked me to add some features to SIFs, and compression was one of them. And at the time, I thought I knew about data compression, but then I started my project and then I realized <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing. And I had to go through, through data compression basics and, and I'll give you a tour about it because there are some questions that I had that some concerns that uh, I end up needing to uh, recap the topic. So this is a quick agenda introduction, the specifications um, that are related to SMB compression and the algorithms, uh, the implementation I currently have about performance of SMB compression, demonstration, and what I'm planning to do. So data compression, basics, this is what we usually think about, where we have a, a kind, some kind of storage, and then we compress something uh, like a file, uh, uh, some, some static data. Then you compress it, you apply the compression engine, you compress it, and it's on the disk. And then at some point, you can decompress it. And the important part here is we put resources to compress and decompress the data, but we want to save storage space. Uh, the end goal here is to save storage space. So it's not really important how, how many resources we allocate to that, like CPU and memory, to, 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 to the compression gene. Because we don't know when we will need to decompress the, that data, that file. On the other hand, when you're over the wire, you have a client, on the left here, and then you have the server, and they have their own storage, and then you do a write, and then you have this original piece of data that you want to, to write to the server, and that you want the same original data to be there, of course. When we're compressing over the wire, uh, we're not really talking about files anymore, we're just talking about uh, blobs of data, so we, we get that, that blob of data, we, we write to the server, but we want them to be identical, of course, as well. But then we apply the compression, the compression engine here at the right, and then we only send the compressed data. Then the server will decompress it and do whatever it wants to do with the, date, with the uncompressed data. So again, we allocate resources, we, uh, put resource to the compression and decompression. But now we, we're not really saving any storage space here. We, we don't care. Uh, but we are saving bandwidth because you reduce what's on the, on the wire. And these are the important parts because we want a response as well. So you want faster response when you're compressing this the, uh, over the wire. This is a read request, which is about the same. The client sends a read request and then the server compresses the data and then responds to the client that we want the same data as well. So what's the motivation to have this and why Microsoft put this in, in their specifications? The cloud, the, the move to the cloud of large uh, workloads, large data made them, uh, in this case, Azure, uh, made them aware that they needed something to reduce these, this kind of traffic, because in the cloud, you pay for the VMs, you pay for uh, compute nodes, you pay for your network, your switches, your IP addresses, you pay for storage, but um, your ingress traffic, when, when you send data to the cloud, it's usually for free, but then, when you want to take it out, you have to pay. <laughs> uh, ransomware, 
kind of. <laughs> yeah, you have to pay to get your, da your data out of the cloud. So that's the problem. And well, of course, if we, sorry. If we have a multi-cloud or uh, intercontinental clouds communicating be between each other, your ingress traffic here, which, you which will be a, a write from the client, then it can become uh, an egress traffic because you're sending to another cloud. So then you also pay here. And if we apply compression to, to this data that's going through, we get less traffic and we get cost savings. So this is the idea to have uh, SMB compression, especially on Azure. Now the specifications and algorithms related to SMB compression. So. MS SMB2 is the core uh, specification for SMB. It defines the, in this case for compression, defines the PDU layout, uh, data, data pattern scanning, and the error handling of compression. Uh, the PDU layout is just uh, a header, and it specifies that you, what you should or should not compress, uh, because you're not really required to compress every every write or every uh, read. Uh, data pattern scanning is a, a compressing algorithm they defined. It's really, uh, you just compare uh, the first 64 bytes to, to the first byte, and if it's larger, you keep going, and you just append a really small payload to, to, the, to the final request. So, for example, if you have a repeating data that's 32K, you can reduce it to, uh, I think, 180 or something. So it's really small. And the error handling, it's uh, when compression goes bad, like I was talking to David yesterday, there are cases where you compress a, a, a piece of data and the compressed size can be larger than the input size. This is uh, natural in compression algorithms. And there are some, some ways to, to detect it. I haven't implemented them yet, but uh, in this case, Microsoft says that you should send the original request instead, the uncompressed one. Then we have MX, MSXCA, which stands for Express Comparison Algorithm. It's actually a set of algorithms um, that are based on LZ77, uh, which they have the raw or plain LZ77, LZ77 with Huffman encoding, and LZNT1, which is a quite old uh, compression algorithm. Um, for those not familiar, LZ77 will count, will um, append literal bytes to the output, and then it starts to find the matches in, 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 in the input. And when it finds, it, you encode it to, uh, I think four, four bytes, four to six bytes uh, that, that match. So you, you have a big match and then you can put it in just a six, six bytes. Um, LZ77, uh, Huffman in this case is applied when, you're, when you have all your symbols where uh, they call literal and match uh, symbols. Then you count it and you create the Huffman tree. You, you, you do some statist statistics on that tree and then you generate, uh, uh, you generate another uh, encode, encoded output, which, um, well, it's another step. It's a post-processing on, on top of LZ77, so it adds uh, overhead, but provides better compression. LZNV1 is, uh, like I said, it's old. I haven't really looked on, in, its, in its details, but it has a, a varying length of the encoded output, so you, you have a match, you can have several um, lengths of, of the output bytes. And this is not the case for Z77, where it's fixed, you have almost a, a six byte um, output. And it, it goes in chunks, like it, it creates its own frame to, to, to compress the data. And that's uh, the least preferred algorithm when you're talking to a Windows server. And recently, they added LZ4 to, to an MS SMB2 as a supported algorithm for Windows Server 2025. They are still uh, responding with LZ4 as the least preferred. And I asked them on Samba XP 
for the team involved, and they said that it's because they don't, they just don't have the, enough data about performance to put LZ4 in a higher uh, precedence of, of the order of the algorithms to use. So they're still, they're still preferring LZ77, then data pat pattern scanning, and then the others. So the implementation. My implementation, I wanted to, to make it simple enough that I could be not invasive, like a really invasive patch, and, well, less chance to break because we're dealing with user data. We don't want to, to, to break that. But at the same time, I wanted to be flexible because I, I only implemented LZ77. Um, so I wanted to add new algorithms without changing many things. And then now LZ4 is uh, new to me as well, so I'll have to take a look at that. But uh, the idea is that I can use something already existing which wasn't the case for LZ77. For those um, more involved, uh, they might say that Deflate and Zlib and some other algorithms in the kernel are already using LZ77, yes. But the way Microsoft specifies in XCA is different. So the uh, how many bits you use to encode the distance, the length, and where do you put a flag to indicate how many literals are there? These, these things are all different, and none of them matches what Microsoft, Microsoft states. So I had to come up with my own implementation. I also preferred speed over compression ratio because, um, like I said, uh, dealing with random data, data that we don't know what it is, it's uh, hard. So I would rather compress it and see it, it's uh, or compression or uncompressible data and just fall back to the original uncompressed version and that as fast as possible instead of trying to compress it as much as I can, for example, using Huffman. Um, yeah, this, uh, right now it's only compressing a data size above page size or 4K. But that's just following what Microsoft does on Windows Server. So I'm not really sure what are the benefits or if any. But one thing is for sure, the, the, PD, the PDU layout, uh, I'll show you in a bit, is that we have the SMB, SMB2 header and then the compressed data. So we we use a lot of data inside this header, so it makes no sense to, to compress it and then have to decompress it or keep track, uh, keep track of, of it through, throughout the code so we can handle errors whatsoever. Um, so we leave it uncompressed. It's yeah, at most like um, 208 bytes, so it's not worth the, the efforts. And we offload. Um, Decompressions in this case above 16K, which is what encryption does in this case, and I just follow it through. Uh, but this is something I will have to revisit. Um, and regarding speed, like I said, fast, uh, I wanted it fast. I had to do some optimizations where this was interesting. I started with um, using an IOV iter to parse data and compress and then send because that's how most reads and writes are done in sys.ko. But I had problems with it due to compression algorithms being uh, requiring byte access, byte aligned access. So this was, this added a big, big overhead. So I just chop it off and then I now, I, I convert everything to a flat buffer and then parse it. Another optimization I did was to, um, where I could access, uh, in this case I put uh, an assigned 34 bit and sign an integer, but for 64 I'm also doing the same. Convert the uh, four, four or eight bytes of the buffer to, to a number and then just sort it to compare matches. So if the sort is not zero, it's uh, not a match. And it's, um, and then, Efficient unaligned access, this is a per architecture 
defined in the kernel where you sometimes you want to access a pointer like this. And the architecture doesn't support it, so it will fetch a four bytes or whatever bytes it's, it fetches by default. So you had a, uh, it adds overhead. And this also adds overhead when you don't have support for it. So one thing I wanted to say here is that I did, uh, I, this wasn't <laughs> premature optimization. I had a, a build with this and without it, and they were about 15 to 20% faster on, on when they were enabled. And this is the PDU, like I said. This is the original request we sent. It's a, a struct. And then we had the, the header, the write request that contains the, the write information. And then it's appended by, uh, the, the data is appended at the end. So this is the uncompressed version. And then I copied over, uncompressed the SMB2 header and the write request header. I compressed the data, appended at the end, and just put the, uh, prepend the compression header that contains all the information required to decompress the uh, data. In this case, uh, when you're encrypting, it does the same thing. You just uh, encrypt the whole buffer instead because the encryption can have no uh, unencrypted parts uh, before the data. So you put the encryption header here, and then you just encrypt, encrypt everything. Right now, encryption plus compression is not working because of uh, how the, the, the module handles encryption, but I'll get it. So performance, uh, this is hard to, to measure. So I'll go with the, as subjectively as possible. <laughs> About six times faster, whatever faster means. Um, this is from Microsoft a demo about SMB compression. They have the the Windows Server running with the share with compression enabled, and then they they do a copy from a Windows client to the server, a 20 gigabyte fi file copy, and these are the results when they do it uncompressed and compressed. Uh, the throughput on the network, that's what we have. It's a great improvement. Uh, bandwidth savings, like I said, great as well. But then we have our uh, trade-off, the CPU usage, which is all compression is all about. When you trade off saving space somewhere to putting more resources in and allocating more resources in to, to, to gain that end goal. So how about Linux? This is what I wanted to show you, I have a VM here. Um, I have a Windows Server 2022 running, which already support compression. And this compress here was the mount option added here. Nothing else, everything else is, is default. So I mount it. Okay, hold on. Let me actually unmount it. Oh. Hmm? Okay. I just want to show you the, where the, can you guys read here this? I think it's, okay, I can increase it. So in the negotiate protocol is where everything is defined for the SMB connection that you're about to make. And then we have the compression capabilities, negotiate context that it's appended and we put the compression algorithms that we support. So we, um, sorry, here, 
is what I appended, what I support, so in this case only LZ77. Um, and it replies with the algorithms it supports as well, being the first, the most preferred algorithm. So I'll just restart here so I can show you better the... So I will start with the right. I have this open source ISO file here, and I'll copy to the share I just mounted. This is something I need to talk with Steve because it's it started sending the the right request, but Swift wasn't getting none until around 80% and then starts standing, so it's not really asynchronous. You see that it's hanged. But now we come to Wireshark and we can see, for example, here, okay, this is something I want to talk to. Um, Wireshark still, like I said, we have several formats and several ways to handling compressed data. And Wireshark, uh, Plugin for SMB compressed SMB doesn't can't handle these uh, writes I'm doing, so I was at first I said, oh, yeah, I don't have no idea what I'm doing, <laughs> but I get a response. That means the server could decompress it and interpret it, and the the response is okay. So the uh, success um, you can see here. So. Uh, I, I, and the bright goes on. If you can see the other, there's no, uh, the connection isn't dropped. There's no error in, in the SIF side as well. So it goes on. Then we can find a, a decompression, uh, a packet that Wireshark can decompress. This is, uh, you can see the transform, compression transform header here is the, the PDU I was talking about. And then this is a Wireshark part where it decompresses what was inside that compressed data. Uh, we can see the SMB2 header and the write request here, and this is the raw uncompressed data. So it understands, the server understands, and the write goes on. And now we can see several uncompressed writes here. These are, like I said, the ones that has uncompressible data. In this case, I try to compress that piece of data, but the output size ended up as the same or higher than the input size. Then we just bail out and send the uncompressed one. That's supposed to supposedly to be faster. Um, then we uh, we go out with a lot of those, and then at the end we have a few more compressed ones. So I said, I thought to myself. I'm probably doing something wrong here because there are like, um, I think, if we look at the, um, all the packets that were sent, These are compressed writes that Wireshark could interpret, but there are just maybe just two to three more <laughs> compressed ones. Whereas on the other hand, we have, uh, if we put them, sorry. The command is write, I'm sorry. A write command. Then we can see as well that there are many, many others that weren't compressed. So I got something wrong, but it's okay. So, yeah. Um, I was wondering what I could be doing wrong. Was I doing something wrong here? Because uh, all the missing uh, compressed packets. And then to uh, proof. To get some proof, I did, uh, well, we'll all start with that. This is the MD5 of, of this file, the one we just copied over, and then there is the 
Okay. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So I, uh, all I had to do was read and see what Windows was compressing, how it was compressing my data, and then I started with the uh, read. And then now this is Windows compressing my file, my, 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 my request, and we can see that decompressed read response, re decompressed. Uh, so Wireshark also can't understand it, so I wasn't in the right, in the right track. <laughs> wasn't a mistake on my side. This was from Windows, so uh, I assumed to be correct. And then we can also see that there are several re responses that weren't compressed. So that um, quite similar. We have a lot of uncompressed read requests in, in the middle, and then a few in, in the beginning, and then a few more at the end. So that was the the proof I had that I, I was in the right track. Um, unfortunately, I had a bug in my code as I was trying to fix like an hour ago. <laughs> and I wish I wanted to demonstrate uh, to show more performance gains and, and stuff, but I won't be able to do so this time, so sorry. And that's pretty much it for, for the demo. Um, uh, one thing I want to notice here is, in my case, I'm copying uh, an OpenSUSE ISO file, which is a file one would find online and use it. But in Microsoft case, they used this uh, 20 gigabyte file, which is a, a VM disk, and it contains a lot of zeros. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the, the that's uh, well what you get for manipulating the data the data you're showing. <laughs> I, I wanted to 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 do the same here, but uh, still I had these issues I wanted to handle first. So they can reduce the the, the time, the copy time from two minutes and forty three seconds to just twenty eight seconds. And this file, like I said, the file layout, the data layout you have as input really really helps. If you copy, if you have like a, a one gigabyte file that's just random data, it will not compress. Uh, random data doesn't compress well, you, it's usually not compressible at all. So for uh, files, you know that you have a lot of zeros, a lot of repeating bytes, a lot of uh, ASCII text. They are, re uh, they are very compressible. They, are, they are, uh, yield good compression, but yeah. So uh, to do what I plan to do now, tests, fixes, like I said, I had a bug just today. Um, there are other things, the um, da data pattern scanning algorithm, uh, it's working, but I got some things wrong that I need to fix, but it's, it's what uh, handles most of these too many zeros or too many repeating bytes well and fast. So I wanted to get it okay as well. Um, well, fixes, and then send an RFC to the mailing list to get it. Uh, well, um, I'm, I set this as experimental, and I hope to stay that way for, <laughs> for a couple of uh, releases, but um, yeah. And in the future, what I want to do is a parallelization, which I don't know how I could achieve that. This is something I... Uh, uh, these these top, topics here are something that I wish to discuss both here and in LSFMMs, if, you're, if anyone is going. Uh, parallelization of, of the compression code. Um, check for compressible data. This is kind of utmost here because, uh, like I said, I don't want to spend time compressing and reverting. I want, I, I could do a quick parse and just detect if that, that data will compress well or not, and just discard it, and like I said, send it in compressed request instead. So this is, I think, uh, uh, Microsoft has um, ReFS, the, the file system ReFS on, on, on their, their products that does uh, dedupe and compress, and in their documents, there's a single statement saying that they, they do 
check if some piece of data is eligible for compression. And when I asked them about it, then I, get, I didn't get any pointers or technical documents on how to how they achieve that, of course. But it's not, uh, well, like I said, in, in ReFS, it's probably running as a service, a background service, so they don't really care if it's fast or not, but they do have it. Well, implement and test other algorithms, which, is, like I said, uh, the other ones mentioned in MS XEA are not really that interesting. Uh, like I said, Huffman will add overhead, will provide better uh, compression, but will add overhead, and not sure if that's uh, desired. Uh, on the other hand, LZ4 is a very good candidate that might, uh, might provide better results than LZ77. I'm not sure yet. And spin-off topics, like I was talking to, to Dave Disseldorp about integrating or, or chaining these uh, reads and writes to ButterFS to bypass one compression or decompression at, at the SIF stage. For example, if you get an ioctal that's flagged like, don't decompress it, I will do it, then we could send the data, the data compressed to the ButterFS and then it will handle whatever, however it wants. Um, Again, I'm, I'm, I don't know how ButterFS does this in the, the internals of these ioctal, but I'll uh, take a look. But this is interesting. Uh, if, if it works, it, it would be really interesting. Uh, maybe move the algorithms to, to lib. Um, like I said, uh, uh, all, we have all these similar implementations in the kernel, but uh, they are all different from each other. And, you either have a, a set of parameters you need to set and uh, or adjust or find the best combination to to get what you want. But in this case, they would be like to some MSXCA kind of uh, uh, directory, maybe I don't know. And another thing I've been asked about is to do this uh, move to lib, but in Rust. So Rust guys are asking for uh, non-core implementations of, of uh, in Rust. So and uh, Steve French said this would be a good candidate for that because it's a small library, it's a, a quick code, and, and then we can use that as a, an incentive to, to others to start using Rust. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Don't be scared. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you tried? Uh, I, I don't actually know if the SMB services on Azure provide compression, but have you tried running this against the Azure you, SMB shares? Because there's an area where perhaps the, the Huffman might be worthwhile because now you're transferring it for yeah. a much larger distance. Yeah, I, th I think you mean the uh, Azure file server? Yes. Oh, that's the, what they call it. Yes, it's, uh, you can enable it. Um, because it, it runs on, on top of their latest Windows server, that I think. But you can enable, yes. It's, I don't remember it being uh, uh, straightforward like other options, but yeah, you can. Like I said, one of the main goals here is to is uh, for Azure these days. <laughs> Hello. Hello. So uh, you said you optimized the access buffer. Right, mm -hmm. to use 32 bit uh, integer mm -hmm. right, on this XOR part. Uh, but this is x664, right? Yeah. So why 32 bits, not 64 yeah. bits? Yeah, I, I mentioned that. I do that for, with uh, 64 bits um, okay, okay. integers as well. Um, this is just, I, I, do, I do like a, a fall through, like a, I try, if I can read eight, eight bytes, mm -hmm. I do with the 64 bit and then 32, 16, and then. All right. And uh, so you don't uh, encrypt the data. So you get the data, whatever they, they send to you, right? Yeah. So, okay, so you don't encrypt the data? No, just compress okay. it. Okay, okay. The, 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 I hear it, I mentioned that uh, we, this was, I only mentioned this because we, you can combine compression and encryption. Encryption is already uh, mm -hmm. mature enough in, in sys.ko, so you can use it. 
But uh, if you compress the data, you can also encrypt it as well, so, and, and that's fine. So in that case, you, you encrypt after you compress, right? No, I compress and then I encrypt. <laughs> But because uh, I would expect the other way around to be, uh, to, be to, to give better uh, compression because if you encrypt the data, then you shuffle things around and you get more randomness in the data, right? Yes, that's well, yes and no. <laughs> the, um, the, the more random the data, the poorer the compression. Yeah. So if you encrypt it first, you have a lot of random data, and yeah. I can't compress it good. And there are, there's this, this thing as well that, like I said, we need some uncompre uncompressed parts here that are interesting for us to handle in the code, but this is not a, a, about the code. Uh, MS SMB2 defines that you must compress first, then you encrypt. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, right. So one comment on the ButterFS uh -huh. um, uh, yeah, encoded I.O. So that won't be an option at this stage because there's no overlap in algorithm support. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you'd need like to add, I think, um, LZ4 support. To yeah, that would be the, the, yeah. the case, yes. Um, and the other question I had was, um, so you mentioned that the SMB2 write header is... Um, Un is is not compressed. Which part? Sorry, this, this so one. So the SMB two header okay. uh, nested within okay. the uh, compression. Yeah. Uh, so that's uncompressed. Yeah. Um, but do you, you said that's a conscious de decision you made, or so is it, is it optional within the protocol, or is yeah, it... it's optional. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, the the protocol says that you can uh, compress everything. Uh, you just need to set the offset here okay. to the correct. Part. So if it's zero, you know that the compressed data starts here, and then in, uh, this would uh, include the, the SMB2 header. Mm -hmm. But in this case, I'm, I'm just setting it fixed to, to the SMB2 header size, uh, okay. the, uh, the header and the write request size, and, and then the compressed data starts below it. And what does Windows do? Huh? What does Windows do? The same it, thing? It or? does the same, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, like I said, there are important data in, in the header that we use to, to keep track of the right, reads and writes, so it uh, makes no sense to either have a shadow copy or uh, decompress it <laughs> to, to check it. Yeah? Okay. Uh, I'm wondering, I'm more thinking out loud, uh, this uh, parallelization effort uh -huh. seems quite interesting to me. Uh, for the reason that traditional networking uh, workloads would parallelize in a way that you would create multiple processes or threads, run those on separate CPUs. They might use different transmit queues, but not necessarily. The important part is that you create multiple processes that send the data out. In this case, you are talking about a single process, so reading a file or writing a file, right? Not really. Um, for this particular case, I was trying to find some solution where I can... Uh, do you know how compression algorithms work? Not quite. It has the... the it starts with the, a window, what they call it, a window, which is how far back in, in the input buffer you can look to, to find matches. So and, uh, it's lighting window. So it, it's uh, the, your current position moves, then you can just look as far back. So this window moves. And the problem is, as I create uh, my compressed output using this window, I, and I move the window, and I can use information from the previous window to compress even better. I'm not doing that with uh, LZ77, but uh, uh, Huffman does it. And, uh, like I said, it provides better compression. But for LZ77, I could just split the, the input buffer in, into several windows yes. and then parallelize that because I'm not using any information from, from a previ previous block. Yes. So I, I just wanted to pick the, those chunks, those windows chunks and compress them in parallel and then I can assemble the, the output. Oh, yeah, yes, it's just that I'm not aware of uh, any other kernel. It may be lack of knowledge on my part, but I'm not aware of any other part of the kernel that does it this way. Uh, uh, that so so you would have a single process 
that would somehow get to in uh, in transmitting the data out it would somehow get to the part where where compression starts and you might uh, and you would have to go asynchronous so you would have to submit this to a work queue i guess this job and then collect data asynchronously so I find that interesting because previously yeah. you had it in the context of your reader process or writer process. Yeah. Now you have to uh, outsource it to someone else to yeah. do the work. Uh, there's one weak point. Uh, you start to be more dependent on the scheduler in this way because if you have a higher workload on the server, yeah. you might start experiencing latency in this way. Yes. So it's more susceptible. So, so that's my kind of thinking. Yeah, so, yeah. so, so, uh, and then of course you have another point where you wait for a response. So, uh, in that case, you go to sleep. So, yes, there is definitely a part where your reader or writer has to go to sleep and wait for a response from the server. So, it's not nothing too new. It's just no. yes, it changes the flow a bit. Yeah. And in my opinion, it may create a weak spot, uh, but also. A point of strength. If if you yeah, yeah if you if you have more CPUs, do the compression then. Yeah, like I said, you need to okay. allocate resources to uh, the more you allocate them, the better, the faster it will be. Not necessarily the better compression, mm -hmm. but um, yes. Regarding the asynchronous part, you could see from from the demo that when I do the write, it finishes the write because uh, it, it finishes in the VFS layer. It said oh. This has been written, but SIFS, being a network file system, still sending the requests. And this is something that I only uh, realized when uh, implementing this, that is, uh, it's not asynchronous. We have a, 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 an asynchronous thread uh -huh. to handling the responses. And it's sleeping, and when we get a response, it wakes up. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's okay, but that's for read. For writing, we just, we are just sending the writes, oh. so it's not really uh, asynchronous. It's All kind right. of uh, yeah. All right. So okay, that makes it easier. And uh, just to explain a bit more the parallelization part, there is this uh, this level of asynchronous that I wanted to handle, which is the write part, and then the level of the algorithm where I wanted to par parallelize the algorithm not necessarily uh, related to an asynchronous or synchronous write. Mm -hmm. It would be asynchronous every time, mm -hmm. as long as the input data is, is bigger than uh, some value that. And mm -hmm. yes, the, the kernel, I, I couldn't find any multi-threaded multi multi implementation on, on, on the compression algorithms. Mm -hmm. uh, this is quite common in user space. Mm -hmm. Yes, where you can set the, the number of, of threads yes. and more jobs you want. But uh, in the kernel, I, I didn't find anything. It was, uh, oh, yeah, n nothing I, uh, that I could use or as a base or at least uh, mm -hmm. uh, get a reference to what how it's doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also wondering, once you uh, begin to have a need to share data between the workers, uh, you might r run into the capacity of caches and evictions, and they will have to share some data if you want to do it this way. So it makes me wonder they might, there might be a threshold uh, when it starts to pay off to actually parallelize when you have to share data. The, uh, you know, mm -hmm. if it's the, uh, the, the simple al algorithm that you can just divide and there is no mm -hmm. dependency between the chunks, that's okay. Yeah. But, the the one you mentioned yeah. yes I feel there might be a threshold where it's worth yeah there definitely will be um, like I said I need to test I uh, have the, all these ideas that I want to test to, to, to implement and test and one of them is uh, just exactly that because the other uh, the traditional compression algorithm will give you a lot of options so you can fine tune the like what kind of resources you want how much compression you want and to, to give you the result that, that you want. So, and in this case, um, Microsoft just has these fixed values, fixed uh, parameters mm -hmm. that are, uh, according to their, to their measures, that are the best. But again, um, this is not really mandated or required from the spec, so I'm kind of free to do 
how I want in Linux. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. Uh, yeah, thank you. Good job. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, I don't know how this compression algorithm works, but maybe you, what you could do is um, inspire yourself on older video decoding and encoding algorithms. So, what they usually did was to you get the keyframe, which is the image itself, then if the next frame, uh, it just moves a little of the part, so you just describe the difference and you go doing that. So it's a quick frame plus uh, many deltas. And at some point, it will be, uh, the frame will change completely and it's, it's better to encode just a quick frame. So in that point, right, you should have no uh, dependencies between the data before. So maybe you could uh, uh, get to it, to it to paralyze from there. Yeah, that's kind of uh, how it's done. Uh, I just keep track of, of, of the first three bytes. For example, this, uh, you define a, the minimum length of a match. So how many bytes you want to match at mm -hmm. least. And that's three, that's fixed. Mm -hmm. So I get those three bytes, I hash it, and I start in a hash table the, the, the position of the, those bytes, the, the first byte. So I do that for the whole window. And then, like I said, in the, in the next window, if I find that hash and its, uh, the, its distance is smaller than the window size, I can look it back. Mm -hmm. I, I, do, I look it back and then use as a match. I, I count the, the matching bytes mm -hmm. following it, and then I count the, byte, the, the match length. Um, so yes, yeah, like I said, I'm storing the previous information somehow, so I'm, I'm not always parsing the, the mm -hmm. whole window. And uh, just a note on that uh, uh, video and image, video and video and images compression algorithms—they are uh, lossy. No, no, no. Yeah. But that, that, that case, you can make it work to be lossless. Uh, yeah, so. yeah. Uh, that's that. I um, I haven't found any solution for that. That aside mm -hmm. from from this hash table stuff. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> any more questions? Thank you. <laughs>